We are here in the new studios of Ignatius Press. Uh, we have Michael Orion with us, one of our leading authors. We expect to have a weighty conversation about The Father's Tale, uh, one of our most impressive and uh, heaviest books. And I actually wrote a blurb on the back. I, this is the first book I think I've ever written, Michael, for a book. And what I said was, the best of Michael O'Brien's novels. He creates characters like Dickens, explores human relationships like Austen, and has the epic scope of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. I believe this novel will merit the inclusion on any list of the world's greatest novels. Now, what would make me say something so elogious as that, Michael? Father, I simply do not know. <laughs> well, let's proceed to the next question then. <laughs> where did you, where'd the idea for this novel come from? Was it some inspiration you had, or your wife yes, uh, whispered uh, to you something? Or? Well, my wife was a very great force behind my creative life. But uh, as with a few of my novels, uh, sometimes uh, a story wholly, entirely a surprise to me has arisen in my imagination while I'm praying, usually uh, with three of them, uh, in front of the exposed blessed sacrament. Uh, so the, I see When you're that praying with three, you mean the Trinity? Praying with three of them? <laughs> no, three of the novels. Three of the novels, okay, I see. Yes, yeah, so over the last, well, we've published nine novels, haven't we? So three of those were... I can't keep track. Me neither. It's 27 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say, you very wisely cut it down from 1,200 pages <laughs> to 1,075. Yeah. We also we could use thinner paper on this, I but suppose. okay. So, what was the prayerful inspiration you had for this well, novel? It was, I think, it was 97, as Pope John Paul II was was calling the Church to pray uh, for the year of the Holy Spirit, the whole year of the Father, uh, the year of Jesus Christ. The, year, the concept of the year of the Father, who's, who remains often unknown to us, except through Jesus, um, and yet who is the foundation of everything. Uh, it, it, I was moved by that, uh, and in prayer, wondering, how do we come to know the Father? Uh, uh, one day in front of the Blessed Sacrament, this story just uh, fountained up within me of a man, a father, uh, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son and also the parable of the good shepherd kind of combined. Uh, it, it, it was a story of a father who goes searching for a lost son. Now, I, I hadn't a firm, clear picture of what the lostness was, but as I prayed, uh, it kind of came clear that this lostness made might be best expressed as a combination of both physical uh, separation and a kind of moral, spiritual lostness. Uh, and so I, I worked on a first draft. That was the late 1990s, uh, the year before the year of the Father. And uh, of course, it's now 2011. So it's been through a lot of changes and rewriting as the concept has clarified. Now, when I get distractions in prayer, nothing comes of it, you <laughs> see. Uh, but here we have someone who, while he's praying, gets these holy distractions and they become something very worthwhile. Now, I recall that because our policy normally is never to give advances for books, we tell aspiring authors, authors send us a manuscript and we'll review it when we get it. This particular book, I think you asked us for an advance so you could travel to Russia. Yes. And we at some po at one point thought that was probably not a wise investment. <laughs> but uh, tell me about that. Well, you did you went to Russia to research this, or what was? We, you know, my my wife and I, a large family and nearly microscopic income at that time of our lives. We. I mean, this is really he's too sense. modest don't because the. Royalties we pay him, I'm telling you, the check, we have to have bigger checks to write all those digits on there, but okay, at that time, the royalties <laughs> were not time, so big. They were just starting to. Please buy his books, okay, so we can afford to keep doing this. Thanks. So I asked Father Fessio if he would, if he would risk funding a, a trip, <laughs> a research trip to Russia. So I actually made two trips to Russia uh, over the next two years. And uh, it was really important foundational experience there. The Russian Christians I met, Orthodox, 
and some Catholics uh, to learn it to learn at ground level, uh, not only what was going on in the thought and the politics of the country at that time, but also okay, the the deeper mystery of what God was doing. Uh, the ethos of that people, their particular genius, let's call it. But why did you pick Russia in the first place? Why couldn't this happen in Alabama, you know, or someplace where a ticket would be cheaper? <laughs> well, I think because I've always been intrigued by this uh, horrendous blow to the body of Christ in the great schism between East and West. And it's always been a, a suffering for me because as a, as a painter, of Christian art. For seven years, in my early years, I painted only Byzantine icons and developed a great love for Eastern spirituality, Eastern Christian spirituality, and a love for Russia, the true spirit of the Russian people. With all their problems, with all their blind spots, mm -hmm. but we have our blind spots too. The two great lungs need to breathe together, East and West. And they have but one heart, and that is Jesus. So how do we begin to bridge this vast oceanic separation between the two, two lungs of the churches? Um, that was my question. Excuse me, though, this is... Uh, you could, you've written other novels that are not don't take place in Russia. That's right. Uh, is there any reason why this particular novel, this particular story, you thought ought to have the Russian landscape? Or, or was it just that you had the two ideas you want to bring together, fatherhood and then the two lungs? It wasn't really ever a top-down rational decision, I want to do this. Uh, perhaps part of the influence was the fact that I live in a, a community in northern Ontario which has been strongly influenced by by the apostolate of Catherine Doherty, who was a Russian baroness who mm -hmm. founded Madonna House, which is a community uh, that is, is now 70, 80 years old. Uh, she came to America to work with the poor after the revolution. Uh, she founded Friendship House in Chicago, Harlem, then went to retire to Canada in this little village called Combermere, Ontario, where my family now lives. There she thought her life in the lay apostolate was over. She was a very worn out person and a, and a holy person. But God had other plans. Uh, around her there gradually was uh, formed, really through divine providence, a whole community which eventually came to be called the Madonna House. And from that foundation of priests and lay apostles, canonically approved by Rome, uh, a new work began, and that was to reintroduce to the West uh, the particular grace of Russian spirituality, mm. uh, the concept of pustinia, a Russian word which means little desert, that the Christian should go out into the desert to a time of silence for a day, typically a day or 24 hours, with a loaf of bread, a jar of water, the Gospels, and to wait on God. You can't bring a glass of wine? Unfortunately not, Father. Okay. This is Russian spirituality. Vodka? Italian. Vodka? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, the Pustinia has now become a very, very famous concept mm -hmm. and component in our spirituality. So she, she was doing a great work. God was doing great work through her. So there was kind of a Russian and Russian Orthodox ambiance already there with you in Combermere and her being there. Yes, All right. very much. Mm. Russian, Russian Catholic, Eastern Rite Catholic. Yes. But Catherine had a great love for the Orthodox as well. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this, uh, normally you send us cover art that you've done yourself. I don't know if I can, here we have, yeah, Father Elijah. This is our first novel by you, yes. Father Elijah, which if you haven't read, please go out and buy it immediately. Uh, but Michael is an artist as well as a writer, and this is from a uh, painting you did yourself, right? Yes. Uh, I think that's the German edition of Father Life. Oh, this is German? Yes. Where's our, oh, our English edition here? Oh, this is, oh, we have all these, yeah, well, this is interesting. 
I can see one reason why Michael sends us his pictures because when we had this edition done, which is the Polish or what is this, Czech or something, do you know what, you know what language that is? That's Croatian. Oh, Croatian. Here, here's what the Croatians did. You get that in focus? All right, so, well, different cultures are different. Uh, what novel is this? This is Eclipse of the Sun. Oh, Eclipse of the Croatian. Sun. Okay. Uh, these are great people. These, these the Verbum characters. people. The Verbum people. Peter is wonderful. I see him in Rome Peter from time Bob. to time. Yes. yes. But I think they wanted, there was a greater tradition there of using cover art uh, as illustration. So the more, that's a dramatic illustration, and it's not really art at all. Well, this, uh, we had some discussion about this picture because some people said, well, it's too generic, you know, and Michael's art is always very intriguing and interesting. Uh, but I was leading the group in favor of this picture oh. because uh, it won't tell you what the book is about. Yeah. But once you've read the book or know the book, once you have that scene uh, in Irkutsk, uh, you know, by the lake there, where what, what's discovered in that boat. I mean, this this really does encapsulate yeah. in a way that you won't know until you read the book. Uh, a beautiful message in that book. Yeah. So in this case, you should judge the book by itself. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's, um, what's next? I actually know what's next, but I want to ask this so he can answer it for you. Well, I've written another unpublishable novel. Um, <laughs> Unpublished yet. Oh, well, but. we'll see. It's, it's my first uh, foray into the genre of science fiction. Uh, now, this story did not emerge while I was praying in front of it. Ah, okay. But I'm having a great deal of fun writing it. It's, it's a um, speculative novel about a, a voyage to our nearest neighbor in the galaxy, the... Uh, the three-star system called Alpha Centauri, set probably about a hundred years in the future. And uh, it deals with a lot of themes such as why would man seek what is beyond our own solar system? What is there something in him that is always yearning for what is beyond? Mm. Without spelling it out uh, in the book, I, I'm really asking, there's is there a hunger for transcendence written into our nature and in the modern age which has denied, by and large denied, the eternal in our being and provides so little to feed the transcendent need, the need for transcendence? Where are we looking for our substitutes? There's a void within modern man, there's a, a deep void. And he goes searching for all kinds of ersatz alternatives. Is the ultimate search for what is beyond uh, going to take the form of interna uh, interplanetary and interstellar space travel at some point? When uh, so all all kinds of science, uh, faith and science issues are raised in the book. Well, you can help my memory, perhaps. I know either Lewis or Tolkien wrote about science fiction. Yes. And I recall, I think it was Lewis, saying that uh, if science fiction is only a medium for telling a story you could have told on Earth, mm -hmm. then it's not being used properly. Yes, I agree. Likewise, if it's only a medium to explore technological advance, it's also not really being used as it ought to be. But science fiction, like fantasy, is meant to depict an other world, yes. something beyond this world. And therefore, the, the, real, the deepest purpose of science fiction would be to give us some intimation of the fact that we are searching for something beyond this world, yes. but that it's not in our stars, it's in ourselves. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Mm. And that, that really is the theme of my new novel. Now, you're also an artist, but it, what came first, art or writing? Art, painting. Uh, for most of my life, uh, raising our six children, my wife and I have uh, 
have considered ourselves to be a family of artists. Uh, How can you support six children by doing art? Well, only, only by the miraculous intervention of God, constantly. And we've lived very, very simply in a remote, remote sections of Canada where uh, housing costs are very low. We've actually, over the last 40 years, uh, been caretakers of rectories in little mission mm. churches, which has no resident priest, and so it's cost almost nothing to live there. We've grown a lot of our own food at various times. We've lived, we've lived at a very, very bottom level of society, uh, and happy to be there. It, there's been a lot of joy there. Struggle, yeah, plenty of struggle, plenty of uh, terrifying moments. Well, well, the growth season is not too long up there either. Rather short, yeah, compared yeah. to California. Yes. But, uh, but uh, so you lived in rectories and so on as a caretaker. You did painting. Yes. W w was there any economic uh, well uh, supplement because of the painting? Yes. As the years went on, uh, my income did come from painting primarily. Uh, churches would commission a painting every now and then. Uh, often individuals. For most of my life as a painter, were our main source of income. People were often very generous to us. They believed in what I was doing, mm. saw the impossibility of it, and people would sometimes give us gifts that would just get us through another week or a month. Well, then how did the writing start? I, I mean. Again, uh, it came as a total surprise to me. Uh, in the 19, late 1970s, I was uh, deeply into painting icons and fulfilling commissions for churches and individuals. Did not think of myself as a writer at all. Um, and yet this, this story kept welling up in my imagination as I was painting. And uh, this story eventually became the novel which you published uh, oh, 17 years later, uh, titled A Cry of Stone. It was the first novel that arose in my imagination but it wasn't the first one you submitted to us. No. Father Elijah was the first, was it not? Uh, Father Elijah was the first. Okay. Well, you see, for, for nigh on 20 years, I kept thinking of myself as a Canadian, which I am. Uh, I kept submitting my novels, my manuscripts, to can mainline Canadian publishers. I see. And they kept sending me these somewhat cryptic letters saying, love your writing, love the story, We'd be glad to publish it, but you must understand that the religious viewpoint in this novel is no longer of interest to the reading public, <laughs> uh, meaning Orthodox Catholicism. And, uh, and in the subtlest form of invitation, they, were, they sometimes asked me to warp the Catholicism or, or simply delete it. Uh -huh. uh, and that's like... We invite you to cut out your heart, heart and yes. soul so that we can make a success of you. Uh, and, mm. and from the beginning I said, no thank you. So Eclipse of the Sun was your first that you wrote? No, A Cry of Stone. A Cry of Stone. A Cry of the Stone. And that was sent around in, in these responses. For years. And then that just sat there. Then what, what came next? Uh, Strangers and Sojourners. Really? Yes. Okay. I wrote that, I think, in 19... 81. Maybe. All right, and that went around, got the same, same type of response. Yeah, mainline publishers. And then? Um, then I put my dusty manuscripts, my failed writing career, on the back shelf and just said, well, that was a good experience. Maybe the grandchildren someday will read this and they'll, they'll enjoy it. Yeah, okay. And I really sincerely let it go. And then one day, uh, I think it was mid-90s, it would have been 94, 95, I was uh, living in the middle of the Canadian church and the Canadian political milieu, which, is, which was at that point really ramping up uh, into an anti-life society. I mean, Canada has been well in advance of all the moral revolution. I wouldn't call it advanced, but I know what you yeah, mean. Uh, regression. Further along in the decline. Yes, well put. Yeah. And uh, we were the f we were had open abortion long before Roe versus Wade. We we were the first to have the third country in the world to have same-sex marriage legalized throughout the country, and all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, the penalization of normal 
traditional families uh, through taxes, tax laws. Um, at every turn in our society, the rewarding of those who are sterile, the heaping of burdens upon those who uh, are open, totally open to life and live the fullness of our faith. So being bottom, bottom feeders, as, as we sometimes thought of ourselves, this uh, created uh, many pressures, many tensions. Uh, and one day I was in our parish church and just crying out to the Lord uh, in prayer. I was, we were caretakers of this little country parish, so, and we had the key, so we could go in there every day and pray. So one day I was in a pit of total discouragement. I had six children to raise, uh, and I was, I was not making it. I had given my whole life to sacred art, and it was just year after year of struggle. And I was, I was pleading with the Lord. I was, I was kneeling in front of the cross and, and kissing it and crying. Now that's not something I like to admit. Definitely not on the public. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a long time ago now. Yeah. And uh, I was weeping, and I, I was saying, I am finished, Lord. We, it's over. I can't go on. And, I, and the church in our country at that time was in a particularly low phase of undeclared apostasy and betrayal of the faith on many levels. No need to go into that at the moment. But let us say, there was very little to support those who choose uh, to live the totality of the Gospels as Roman Catholics, the fullness of our faith, within our particular churches, as well as the larger configuration around us in the politics and social generation. So, total discouragement. So I was just crying out to the Lord, and I, I pleaded with him. I said, don't you see, Lord, don't you see what's happening? Um, and I suppose a lot of, a lot of self-pity was there too. Don't you see what's happening to me? <laughs> <laughs> so, but really weeping and pleading from the heart in a way that I had not until then. I said, don't you see what a desolation this has become? This is, your church is a desolation here, Lord. And at that instant, uh, I don't know how to describe this adequately, but there was this total interior stop, um, silence. Um, this supernatural peace flooded me, and it had no rational content, but it was like presence, the total presence. The Lord was in the tabernacle, the Blessed Sacrament, and I knew that. But now it was, I could feel that presence in a way I hadn't until that, that instant. And I heard an interior voice that said, in this place of desolation, I will give fruitfulness. And I was still in my, my filthy, despairing, black Irish mood. <laughs> Then I pushed it away. I thought it was a distraction. I thought, yeah, 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 that's my subconscious talking. And then the word came again. And with it, a greater peace. And so then I stopped, then I shut up. I just rested in this peace. And then there came this instruction, go and read the scripture. So I, I stood up from the cross and I went up to the lectern on the altar and I opened the lectern. Uh, opened the lectionary, <coughs> and the first thing my eyes lit on was a passage from the Old Testament, one of the wisdom books. Forgive me, I didn't write it down. Uh, I, I can't now remember where it was, but it, it said, in this place of desolation, I will give fruitfulness. <laughs> I mean, this is seconds after my my immense complaining to God. Now that was, that was, whoa, that just silenced me totally. And it, this peace just pushed away all my mood of discouragement and fear and, and hopelessness. 
But I didn't know what it meant. How on earth would God give fruitfulness through me? You know, this a very small, poor man and weak man. At that very moment, I, well, I did kneel down. I knelt down and I said, thank you. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you for this word, for, for giving me hope, this word of encouragement. And at that moment, uh, totally to my surprise, this whole story of Father Elijah just flooded into my imagination. I began to watch this movie. I just knelt there for an hour watching watching this interior movie. Now, this does not happen to me. <laughs> I have a big Irish imagination, but <laughs> it certainly never happens like that. And there was, again, this, this supernatural peace with it. Uh, it was just the whole form of the work was, was there, given, and also uh, an instruction, or a sense of instruction, not literal words, that I should go and write it down. I should write this story in the form of a novel, which I did. And at the time, I was kind of a, an editor of a small Catholic family magazine, so I had a tiny, a tiny bit of an income that allowed me for the next eight months to write the novel, Father, which eventually became Father Elijah. I had never written anything so easily. In terms of writing, it has flaws, it's, but, but the flow of the work. Okay, so you thing. wrote this down. Yeah. Did you send that to the mainline Canadian publishers as well? No, no, uh, I hadn't. I hadn't banished fatalism. You went to the church you, and you heard this voice saying, "Send it to Ignatius Press." No, <laughs> no, 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 that didn't happen. I'm it did sorry, not. Sorry, no, okay, it didn't. There were no more voices. Okay, Gavin's. Now some of my relatives hear voices, and they're in institutions. Okay, but, uh, this was more just a gentle word. Uh, well, how did it come to it, us? Well, I wrote it in obedience, and for six months after I wrote it, I said, there, I wrote it in obedience. I think my call is just to be someone who obeyed God and was here and was rejected and wasn't, he found no place in the modern age, but at least the word was spoken. That's why I conceived it. And then one day, maybe six months after completing the book, the book um, your general manager, Tony Ryan, phoned me. He'd come across a little book of rosary paintings that I had painted and my wife and I had self-published. And he said, I, I saw your rosary book. Uh, have, you, have you done anything else? Uh, we might be interested to look at it. And I said, uh, again, my fatalism and lack of, real lack of faith. I, I said, well, it, well yeah, I, I, I wrote a manuscript, a novel, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't be interested. Because uh, I knew Ignatius Press was not publishing. We fiction. didn't publish novels, no. No. And and hardly any Catholic publisher was publishing fiction. It seemed to be have died out right. after the 1950s. Yeah. So I said, uh, you wouldn't be interested. And uh, he said, well, we might be. He said, why don't you send us the manuscript? I said, I, I don't want to waste your time. I said, and besides, I said, I know you're a nice guy, but I gotta be frank. I said, I don't have 10 bucks to pay for the postage to send you a manuscript that you're going to reject. And so Tony, with his, uh, his great Irish uh, irony, said, send us the manuscript, we'll send you the $10. <laughs> By the way, Father, he never did send me the $10. I was in your last worldly check. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, two months later, a contract came, and it was like a miracle to me. Uh, two months I, later, that's kind of unusual. It takes yeah, us longer to see books. Yeah. I, was, I was totally stunned. Well, let me interject a bit in this beautiful story, you know, for the comic relief usually. <laughs> but uh, at Ignatius Press, you know, we're, we live like a family of, in so, of a sort. Uh, we, we have mass together in the morning and morning prayer, and we come to the angels together in, in midday prayer. So we're trying to be with the church and support the church, but none of us really had any experience in publishing. Really? And uh, I mean, the way we began, that's a whole long story, but once we did begin, uh, we didn't do marketing surveys or focus groups. Uh, you know, our idea was we will publish what we like to read and what we think will help the church. 
Mm. You know, that was just our criteria. It was, it was a great thing to be able to say, hey, if we like it, maybe someone else will like it. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't published novels. And, and I'm not a literary critic. I'm not even educated in, in literature very well. I, mean, I, I was an engineer and then a theologian. Uh, but the manuscript, I remember getting the manuscript, another big, you know, <laughs> manuscript. We get it. I read it, I couldn't put it down. I said, well, this is, I think this is good. I mean, I mean, I don't know, I can't tell you why, I can't defend it, but this, this to me seems like it's beautifully written. It's a wonderful story, uh, deeply spiritual and, and religious and Catholic. Uh, we passed it around, we said, hey, this is really good. We have to do this. So we didn't do it thinking that we're going to get rich on it or you're going to get rich on it. Or, or we just said, this is something we like and others should like it as well. But it's interesting, you didn't send one of the first two manuscripts here. You sent Father Elijah, the one that you had been basically oh, inspired to write. I wonder why I did that. I and don't know. And then Strangers and Soldiers came after, I think, it was the yes, second one. Yes, it was one. the next book. Yes. But although it's related. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're interrelated. Okay. Well, that, that's an interesting story. Uh, that's probably enough drama for, uh, for one <laughs> conversation. But, you know, our, our camera crew here is also part of the staff here at Ignatius Press. Uh, are there any questions that you want to ask uh, Michael O'Brien? If you ask him, I'll repeat them in the, in the microphone. So our, our question from our camera crew here is, uh, can Michael tell us anything about the possibility of Father Elijah becoming a movie? Uh, well, there have been, since it was first published, there have been, I would say, six, maybe eight different film companies interested in the book, turning it into a film. But for various providential reasons, none of this ever came to pass. One of them was Columbia TriStar. Uh, Ignatius Press, God bless them forever, uh, respected my request that we not permit the book to be turned into a film in any way that, that might alter the spiritual essence of the story. We knew that uh, to take a book from, uh, from text to film always necessitates uh, adaptation. But we, we weren't talking about adaptation, we were talking about tinkering with the essential meaning of the word, the logos or the or its mission in the world, if we could call it that. Uh, we felt that Columbia TriStar, in its successive treatments before contract signing, its treatments of Father Elijah weren't getting it and were altering things too far. So we said we would never accept that, and they dropped the project, and thanks be to God they did. Uh, other film production companies uh, with, with very high motivation have uh, taken on the project only to find that they could not raise sufficient funds. To, to turn a book like this into a film. The film that it ought to be. The film that it ought to be yeah. is, is a daunting task, not only creatively, but marketing is a major problem. So it's a, it's a great risk on the part of investors. I think that's probably been the major barricade, but my sense is that if, if God wants it to be a film, it will be in his time and in his way. Presently, we've just uh, uh, two, two gifted young writers, uh, my son John, if I I'm <laughs> going to say, one of them is your son, that's yes, right, but yeah. he is gifted, I know him. Yeah, he's, and he's... Uh, you know, leaving all nepotism aside, uh, he, he is very gifted. And he and um, a Slovak-Canadian writer and, and filmmaker have put together a very fine script. Uh, presently, uh, we have interested a number of Catholic filmmakers in the script. And if uh, the production company should come to the point where they feel they could begin to launch the project, they would then approach my publisher, and apply for film rights. That's where it is right now. It's it's a very long-range hmm. project, depending on God. Well, thank you, Malcolm. Maybe someone watching this uh, will be a film producer <laughs> or a film uh, supporter that can help bring this wonderful book, uh, written really uh, at the request of our Lord, you know, as fruitfulness from desolation or discouragement and make it into a beautiful film to get other people to receive the fruits of this. Oh, well, before I conclude, 
I mean, you're right now your idea is to sort of pull back from writing and yeah. concentrate on, on, on your painting, right? Yes. Okay, until our Lord tells you to write something else. Is that For it? Ignatius, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Father.